I'm about to read a study in Emerald written by Neil Gaiman, illustrations and layout by Juni Kovanen. I hope I pronounced that right. I do not own any rights to the story. I make no claim to owning any rights. I am merely using this as a teaching tool for my adult education class. Uh, that's all. Educational purposes only. Part 1. The New Friend. The Strand Players. Fresh from their stupendous European tour where they performed before several of the crowned heads of Europe, garnering their plaudits and praise with magnificent dramatic performances, combining both comedy and tragedy. The Strand Players wish to make it known that they shall be appearing at the Royal Court Theatre, Drury Lane, for a limited engagement in April at which they will present my look-alike brother Tom, the littlest violet seller, and the great old ones come, this last and historical epic of pageantry and delight. Each an entire play in one act. Tickets are available now from the box office. Part 1. It is the immensity, I believe, the hugeness of things below, the darkness of dreams. But I am wool-gathering. Forgive me, I am not a literary man. I had been in need of lodgings. That was how I met him. I wanted someone to share the costs of rooms with me. We were introduced by a mutual acquaintance in the chemical laboratories of St. Bart's. You have been in Afghanistan, I perceive. That was what he said to me, and my mouth fell open and my eyes opened very wide. Astonishing, I said. Not really, said the stranger in the white lab coat, who was to become my friend. From the way you hold your arm, I see you have been wounded, and in a particular way. You have a deep tan. You also have a military bearing. And there are few enough places in the empire that a military man can be both tanned and, given the nature of the injury to your shoulder and the traditions of the Afghan cave folk, tortured. Put like that, of course, it was absurdly simple. But then it always was. I had been tanned nut brown, and I had indeed, as he had observed, been tortured. The gods and men of Afghanistan were savages, unwilling to be ruled from Whitehall or from Berlin or even from Moscow, and unprepared to see reason. I had been sent into those hills attached to the Nth Regiment. As long as the fighting remained in the hills and mountains, we fought on an equal footing. When the skirmishes descended into the caves in the darkness, then we found ourselves, as it were, out of our depth and in very much over our heads. I shall not forget the mirrored surface of the underground lake, nor the thing that emerged from the lake, its eyes opening and closing, and the singing whispers that accompanied it as it rose, breathing their way about it like the buzzing of flies bigger than worlds. That I survived was a miracle, but survive I did, and I returned to England with my nerves and shreds and tatters. The place that leech-like mouth had touched me was tattooed forever, frog-white into the skin of my now-withered shoulder. I had once been a crack shot. Now I had nothing save a fear of the world beneath the world, akin to a panic which meant that I would gladly pay sixpence of my army pension for a hansom cab, rather than a penny to travel underground. Still, the fogs and darkness of London comforted me, took me in. I had lost my first lodgings because I screamed in the night. I had been in Afghanistan. I was there no longer. I scream in the night, I told him. I have been told that I snore, he said, and I also keep irregular hours and I often use the mantelpiece for target practice. I will need the sitting room to meet clients. I am selfish, private, and easily bored. Will this be a problem? I smiled and I shook my head and extended my hand. We shook on it. The rooms he had found for us in Baker Street were more than adequate for two bachelors. I bore in mind all my friend had said about his desire for privacy, and I forbore from asking him what he did for a living. Still, there was much to pique my curiosity. Visitors would arrive at all hours, and when they did, I would leave the sitting room and repair to my bedroom, pondering what they could have in common with my friend. The pale woman with one eye bone white, the small man who looked like a commercial traveler, the portly dandy in his velvet jacket, and the rest. Some were frequent visitors, many others came only once, spoke to him, and left, looking troubled or looking satisfied. He was a mystery to me. We were partaking of one of our landlady's magnificent breakfasts one morning when my friend rang the bell to summon that good lady. There will be a gentleman joining us in about four minutes, he said. We will need another place at table. Very good, she said. I'll put more sausages under the grill. 
My friend returned to perusing his morning paper. I waited for an explanation with growing impatience. Finally, I could stand it no longer. I don't understand. How could you know that in four minutes we would be receiving a visitor? There was no telegram, no message of any kind. He smiled thinly. You did not hear the clatter of a brougham several minutes ago? It slowed as it passed us, obviously as the driver identified our door. Then it sped up and went past, up into Marleybone Road. There is a crush of carriages and taxicabs letting off passengers at the railway station and at the waxworks, and it is in that crush that anyone wishing to alight without being observed will go. The walk from here to there, from there to here, is but four minutes. He glanced at his pocket watch, and as he did so, I heard a tread on the stairs outside. Come in, Lestrade, he called. The door is ajar, and your sausages are coming out, just coming out from under the grill. A man I took to be Lestrade opened the door, then closed it carefully behind him. I should not, he said. But truth to tell, I have had, not had, a chance to break my fast this morning, and I, I could certainly do justice to a few of those sausages. He was the small man I had observed on several occasions previously, whose demeanor was that of a traveler in rubber, rubber novelties or patent nostrums. My friend waited until our landlady had left the room before he said, Obviously, I take it this is a matter of national importance. My stars, said Lestrade, and he paled. Surely the word cannot be out already. Tell me it is not. He began to pile his plate high with sausages, kipper fillets, kettigree, and toast, but his hands shook a little. Of course not, said my friend. I know the squeak of your brougham wheels. Though, after all this time, an oscillating G-sharp high above above high C, and if Inspector, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard cannot publicly be seen to come into the parlor of London's only consulting detective, yet comes anyway, and without having had his breakfast, then I know that this is not a routine case. Ergo, it involves those above us and is a matter of national importance. Lestrade dabbed egg yolk from his chin with his napkin. I stared at him. He did not look like my idea of a police inspector, but then my friend looked little enough like my idea of a consulting detective, whatever that might be. Perhaps we should discuss the matter privately, Lestrade said, glancing at me. My friend began to smile impishly, and his head moved on his shoulders as it did when he was enjoying a private joke. Nonsense, he said. Two heads are better than one, and what is said to one of us is said to us both. If I am intruding, I said gruffly, but he motioned me to silence. Lestrade shrugged. It's all the same to me, he said after a moment. If you solve the case, then I have my job. If you don't, then I have no job. You use your methods, and that's what I say. It can't make things any worse. If there's one thing that a study of history has taught us, it is that things can always get worse, said my friend. When do we go to shortage? Lestrade dropped his fork. This is too bad, he exclaimed. Here you were making sport of me when you know all about the matter. You should be ashamed. No one has told me anything of the matter. When a police inspector walks into my room with fresh splashes of mud of that peculiar mustard yellow hue on his boots and trouser legs, I can surely be forgiven for presuming that he has recently walked past the diggings at Hobbs Lane in Shoreditch, which is the only place in London that particular mustard-colored clay seems to be found. Inspector Lestrade looked embarrassed. Now you put it like that, he said. It seems so obvious. My friend pushed his plate away from him. Of course it does, he said, slightly testily. We rode to the east end in a cab. Inspector Lestrade had walked up to the Marleybone Road to find his brougham and left us alone. So you are truly a consulting detective, I said. The only one in London, or perhaps the world, said my friend. I do not take cases. Instead, I consult. Others bring me their insoluble problems, they describe them, and sometimes I solve them. Then those people who come to you are in the main police officers or detectives themselves, yes. It was a fine morning, but we were now jolting about the edges of the rookery of St. Giles, that warren of thieves and cutthroats which sits on London like a cancer on the face of a pretty flower cellar, and the only light to enter the cab was dim and faint. Are you sure that you wish me along with you? In reply, my friend stared at me without blinking. I have a feeling, he said, 
I, I have a feeling we were meant to be together, that we have fought the good fight side by side in the past or in the future. I do not know. I am a rational man, but I have learned the value of a good companion, and from the moment I clapped eyes on you, I knew I trusted you as well as I do myself. Yes, I want you with me. I blushed, or said something meaningless, for the first time since Afghanistan. I felt I had worth in the world. 2. The Room Victor's Vitae! Victor's Vitae! An electrical fluid. Do your limbs and nether regions lack life? Do you look back on the days of your youth with envy? Are the pleasures of the flesh now buried and forgot? Victor's Vitae will bring life where life has long been lost. Even the oldest warhorse can be a proud stallion once more, bringing life to the dead from an old family recipe and the best of modern science. To receive signed attestations of the efficacy of Victor's Vitae, write to the V. Von F. Company, 1B Cheap Street, London. It was a cheap rooming house in Shoreditch. There was a policeman at the front door. Lestrade greeted him by name and made to usher us in, and I was ready to enter. But my friend squatted on the doorstep and pulled a magnifying glass from his coat pocket. He examined the mud on the wrought iron boot scraper, prodding at it with his forefinger. Only when he was satisfied would he let us go inside. We walked upstairs. The room in which the crime had been committed was obvious. It was flanked by two burly constables. Lestrade nodded to the men, and they stood aside. We walked in. I am not, as I said, a writer by profession, and I hesitate to describe that place, knowing that my words cannot do it justice. Still, I have begun this narrative, and I fear I must continue. A murder had been committed in that little bedsit. The bo what was left of it was still there on the floor. I saw it, but at first, somehow, I did not see it. What I saw instead was what had sprayed and gushed from the throat and chest of the victim. In color, it ranged from bile green to grass green. It had soaked into the threadbare carpet and spattered the wallpaper. I imagined it for one moment the work of some hellish artist who had decided to create a study in emerald. After what seemed like a hundred years, I looked down at the body, opened like a rabbit on a butcher's slab, and tried to make sense of what I saw. I removed my hat, and my friend did the same. He knelt and inspected the body, inspecting the cuts and gashes. Then he pulled out his magnifying glass and walked over to the wall, examining the gouts of drying eaker. We've already done that, said Inspector Lestrade. Indeed, said my friend. Then what did you make of this, then? I do not believe it is a word. Lestrade walked to the place my friend was standing and looked up. There was a word written in capitals. In green blood on the faded yellow wallpaper, some little way above Lestrade's head. Rache, said Lestrade, spelling it out. R A C H E. Obviously, he was going to write Rachel, but he was interrupted. So we must look for a woman. My friend said nothing. He walked back to the corpse and picked up its hands, one after the other. The fingertips were clean of eager. I think we have established that the word was not written by his royal highness. What the devil makes you say that? My dear Lestrade, please give me some credit for having a brain. The corpse is obviously not that of a man. The color of his blood, the number of limbs, the eyes, the position of his face, all these things bespeak the blood royal. While I cannot say which royal line, I would hazard that he is an heir. Perhaps no second to the throne in one of the German principalities. That is amazing, Lestrade hesitated. Then he said, this is Prince Franz Drago of Bohemia. He was here in Albion as a guest of Her Majesty Victoria, here for a holiday and a change of air. For the theaters, the horrors, and the gaming tables, you mean? If you say so, Lestrade looked put out. Anyway, you've given us a fine lead with this Rachel woman, although I don't doubt we would have found her on our own. Doubtless, said my friend. He inspected the room further, commenting acidly several times that the police, with their boots, had obscured footprints and moved things that might have been of use to anyone attempting to reconstruct the events of the previous night. Still, he seemed interested in a small patch of mud he found behind the door. Beside the fireplace, he found what appeared to be some ash or dirt. Did you see this? he asked Lestrade. Her Majesty's police, replied Lestrade tend not to be excited by ash in a fireplace. 
It's where ash tends to be found. And he chuckled at that. My friend took a pinch of the ash and rubbed between his fingers, then sniffed the remains. Finally, he scooped up what was left of the material and tipped it into a glass vial, which he stoppered and placed in an inner pocket of his coat. He stood up, and the body, Lestrade said, the palace will send their own people. My friend nodded at me, and together we walked to the door. My friend sighed. Inspector, your quest for Miss Rachel may prove fruitless. Among other things, Reich is a German word. It means revenge. Check your dictionary. There are other meanings. We reached the bottom of the stair and walked out onto the street. You have never seen royalty before this morning, have you? He asked. I shook my head. Well, the sight can be unnerving if you're unprepared. Why, my good fellow, you are trembling. Forgive, forgive me. I shall be fine in moments. Would it do you good to walk, he asked, and I assented, certain that if I did not walk, then I would begin to scream. West, then, said my friend, pointing to the dark tower of the palace, and we commenced to walk. So, said my friend, after some time, you have never had any personal encounters with any of the crowned heads of Europe? No, I said. I believe I can confidently state that you shall very soon, he told me, and not with a corpse this time, very soon. My dear fellow, whatever makes you believe, in reply, he pointed to a carriage, black painted, that had pulled up fifty yards ahead of us. A man in a black top hat and a great coat stood by the door, holding it open, waiting silently. A coat of arms familiar to every child in Albion was painted in gold upon the carriage door. There are invitations one does not refuse, said my friend. He doffed his own hat to the footman, and I do believe that he was smiling as he climbed into the box-like space and relaxed back into the soft leathery cushions. When I attempted to speak with him during the journey to the palace, he placed his finger over his lips. Then he closed his eyes and seemed sunk in deep in thought. I, for my part, tried to remember what I knew of German royalty. But apart from the Queen's consort, Prince Albert, being German, I knew little enough. I put a hand in my pocket, pulled out a handful of coins, brown and silver, black and copper green. I stared at the portrait stamped on each of them of our queen, and felt both patriotic pride and stark dread. I told myself I had once been a military man, and a stranger to fear, and I could remember a time when this had been the plain truth. For a moment I remembered a time when I had been a crack shot, even, I liked to think, something of a marksman. But my right hand shook as if it were palsied, and the coins jingled and chinked, and I felt only regret. Part 3. The Palace. At long last, Dr. Henry Jekyll is proud to announce the general release of the world-renowned Jekyll's Powders for popular consumption. No longer the province of the privileged few, release the inner you for inner and outer cleanliness. Too many people, both men and women, suffer from constipation of the soul. Relief is immediate and cheap with Jekyll's Powders, available in vanilla and original metholium formulation. The Queen's consort, Prince Albert, was a big man with an impressive handlebar mustache and a receding hairline, and he was undeniably and entirely human. He met us in the corridor, nodded to my friend and to me, did not ask us for our names or offer to shake hands. The Queen is most upset, he said. He had an accent. He pronounced his S's and Z's, most upset. Franz was one of her favorite nephews. She has so many nephews, but he made her laugh so. You will find the ones who did this to him? I will do my best, said my friend. I have read your monographs, said Prince Albert. It was I who told them you should be consulted. I hope I did right. As do I, said my friend. And then the great door was opened, and we were ushered into the darkness in the presence of the queen. She was called Victoria because she had beaten us in battle 700 years before. And she was called Gloriana because she was glorious. And she was called the queen because the human mouth was not shaped to say her true name. She was huge, huger than I had imagined possible. And she squatted in the shadows, staring down at us without moving. This must be solved. The words came from the shadows. Indeed, ma'am, said my friend. A limb squirmed and pointed at me. Step forward. I wanted to walk. My legs would not move. My friend came to my rescue then. He took me by the elbow and walked me toward Her Majesty. He is not to be afraid. He is to be worthy. He is to be a companion. That was what she said to me. 
Her voice was a very sweet contralto with a distant buzz. Then the limb uncoiled and extended, and she touched my shoulder. There was a moment, but only a moment, of a pain deeper and more profound than anything I have ever experienced, and then it was replaced by a pervasive sense of well-being. I could feel the muscles in my shoulder relax, and for the first time since Afghanistan, I was free from pain. Then my friend walked forward. Victoria spoke to him, yet I could not hear her words. I wondered if they went, somehow, directly from her mind to his, if this was the Queen's counsel I had read about in the histories. He replied aloud, Certainly, ma'am. I can tell you that there were two other men with your nephew in that room in Shoreditch. That night, the footprints were, although obscured, unmistakable. And then, yes, I, I understand. I, I believe so. Yes. He was quiet when we left the palace and said nothing to me as we rode back to Baker Street. It was dark already. I wondered how long we had spent in the palace. Fingers of sooty fog twined across the road and the sky. Upon our return to Baker Street in the looking glass of my room, I observed that the frog-white skin across my shoulder had taken on a pinkish tinge. I hoped that I was not imagining it, that it was not merely the moonlight through the window. Part 4. The Performance Liver complaints, bilious attacks, neurasthenic disturbances, quinsy, arthritis. These are just a handful of the complaints for which a professional exsanguination can be the remedy. In our offices, we have sheaves of testimonials which can be inspected by the public at any time. Do not put your health in the hands of amateurs. We have been doing this for a very long time. V. Zepsch, professional exsanguinator. Remember it. It is pronounced Zepfesh. Romania, Paris, London, Whitby. You've tried the rest. Now try the best. That my friend was a master of disguise should have come as no surprise to me, yet surprise me it did. Over the next ten days, a strange assortment of characters came in through our door in Baker Street. An elderly Chinese man, a young Rue, a fat, red-haired woman, of whose former profession there could be little doubt, and a venerable old buffer, his foot swollen and bandaged by from gout. Each of them would walk into my friend's room, and with the speed that would have done justice to a music hall, quick change artist, my friend would walk out. He would not talk about what he had been doing on these occasions, preferring to relax, staring off into space, occasionally making notations on any scrap of paper to hand. Notations I found, frankly, incomprehensible. He seemed entirely preoccupied, so much so that I found myself worrying about his well-being. And then, late one afternoon, he came home dressed in his own clothes with an easy grin upon his face and he asked if I was interested in the theater. As much as the next man, I told him. Then fetch your opera glasses, he told me. We are off to Drury Lane. I had expected a light opera or something of the kind, but instead I found myself in what must have been the worst theater in Drury Lane, for all that it had named itself after the royal court, and to be honest, it was barely in Drury Lane at all, being situated at the Shaftesbury Avenue end of the road, where the avenue approaches the rookery of St. Giles, on my friend's advice, I concealed my wallet, and following his example, I carried a stout stick. Once we were seated in the stalls, I had bought a three-penny orange from one of the lovely young women who sold them to the members of the audience, and I sucked at it as we waited. My friend said, quietly, You should only count yourself lucky that you did not need to accompany me to the gambling dens or the brothels or the madhouses, another place that Prince Franz delighted in visiting, as I had learned but there was nowhere he went to more than once. Nowhere but. The orchestra struck up, and the curtain was raised. My friend was silent. It was a fine enough show in its way. Three one-act plays performed were performed. Comic songs were sung between the acts. The leading man was tall, languid, and had a fine singing voice. The leading lady was elegant, and her voice carried through all the theater. The comedian had a fine touch for patter songs. The first play was a broad comedy of mistaken identities. The leading man played a pair of identical twins who had never met, but had managed by a set of comical misadventures, each to find himself engaged to be married to the same young lady, who amusingly thought herself engaged to only one man. Doors swung open and closed as the actor changed from identity to identity. The second play was a heartbreaking tale of an orphan girl who starved in the snow selling hothouse violets. 
Her grandmother recognized her at last and swore that she was the babe stolen ten years back by bandits, but it was too late, and the frozen little angel breathed her last. I must confess, I found myself wiping my eyes with my linen handkerchief more than once. The performance finished with a rousing historical narrative. The entire company played the men and women of a village on the shore of the ocean, 700 years before our modern times. They saw shapes rising from the sea in the distance. The hero joyously proclaimed to the villagers that these were the old ones whose coming was foretold, returning to us from Riley and from dim Carcosa and from the plains of Lang, where they had slept or waited or passed out the time of their death. The comedian opined that the other villagers had all been eating too many pies and drinking too much ale, and they were imagining the shapes. A portly gentleman playing a priest of the Roman god tells the villagers that the shapes in the sea were monsters and demons and must be destroyed. At the climax, the hero beat the priest to death with his own crucifer and prepared to welcome them as they came. The heroine sang a haunting aria, whilst in an astonishing display of magic lantern trickery, it seemed as if we saw their shadows cross the sky at the back of the stage. The Queen of Albion herself and the Black One of Egypt, in shape almost like a man, followed by the ancient goat, parent of to a thousand, emperor of all China, and the Tsar unanswerable, and he who presides over the New World, and the White Lady of the Antarctica Fastus, and the others. And as each shadow crossed the stage, or appeared to, from out of every throat in the gallery came, unbidden, a mighty huzzah, until the air itself seemed to vibrate. The moon rose in the painted sky, and then, at its height, in one final moment of theatrical magic, it turned from a pallid yellow, as it was in the old tales, to the comforting crimson of the moon that shines down upon us all today. The members of the cast took their bows and their curtain calls to cheers and laughter, and the curtain fell for the last time and the show was done. There, said my friend. What did you think? Jolly, jolly good, I told him, my hand sore from applauding. Stout fellow, he said with a smile, let us go backstage. We walked outside and into an alley beside the theater to the stage door, where a thin woman with a wen on her cheek knitted busily. My friend showed her a visiting card, and she directed us into the building and up some steps to a small communal dressing room. Oil lamps and candles guttered in front of smeared looking glasses, and men and women were taking off their makeup and costumes with no regard to the proprieties of gender. I averted my eyes. My friend seemed unperturbed. Might I talk to Mr. Vernet? he asked loudly. A young woman who had played the heroine's best friend in the first play, and the saucy innkeeper's daughter in the last, pointed us to the end of the room. Sherry, Sherry Vernet, she called. The young man who had stood up in response was lean, less conventionally handsome than he had seemed from the other side of the footlights. He peered at us quizzically. I do not believe I have had the pleasure. My name is Henry Camberley, said my friend, drawling his speech somewhat. You may have heard of me. I must confess that I have not had that privilege, said Rene. My friend presented the actor with an engraved card. The man looked at the card with unfeigned interest. A theatrical promoter? From the New World? My, my! And this is... he looked at me. This is a friend of mine, Mr. Sebastian. He is not of the profession. I muttered something about having enjoyed the performance enormously and shook hands with the actor. My friend said, Have you ever visited the New World? I have not yet had that honor, admitted Rene, although it has always been my dearest wish. Well, my good man, said my friend with the easy informality of a New Worlder, maybe you'll get your wish. That last play, I've never seen anything like it. Did you write it? Alas, no. The playwright is a good friend of mine, although I devised the mechanism of the Magic Lantern Shadow Show. You will not see finer on the stage today. Would you give me the playwright's name? Perhaps I should speak to him directly, this friend of yours. Rene shook his head. That will not be possible, I am afraid. He is a professional man, and does not wish his connection with the stage publicly to be known. I see. My friend pulled a pipe from his pocket and put it in his mouth. Then he patted his pockets. I am sorry, he began. I have forgotten to bring my tobacco pouch. Well, I smoke a strong black shag, said the actor, but if you have no objection. None, said my friend heartily. Why, I smoke a strong shag myself. And he filled his pipe with the actor's tobacco, and the two men puffed away 
while my friend described a vision he had for a play that could tour the cities of the New World, from Manhattan Island all the way to the furthest tip of the continent in the distant south. The first act would be the last play we had seen. The rest of the play might perhaps tell of the dominion of the old ones over humanity and its gods, perhaps telling what might have happened if people had no royal families to look up to, a world of barbarism and darkness. But your mysterious professional man would be the play's author, and what occurs would be his alone to decide, interjected my friend. Our drama would be his, but I can guarantee you audiences beyond your imaginings and a significant share of the takings at the door. Let us say 50%. Well, this is most exciting, said Renee. I hope it will not turn out to have been a pipe dream. No, sir, it shall not, said my friend, puffing on his own pipe, chuckling at the man's joke. Come to my rooms in Baker Street tomorrow morning after breakfast time. Say at 10, in company with your author friend, and I shall have the contracts drawn up and waiting. With that, the actor clambered up onto his chair and clapped his hands for silence. Ladies and gentlemen of the company, I have an announcement to make, he said, his resonant voice filling the room. This gentleman is Henry Camberlay, the theatrical promoter, and he is proposing to take us across the Atlantic Ocean and on to fame and fortune. There were several cheers, and the comedian said, Well, it'll make a change from herrings and pickled cabbage, and the company laughed. And it was to the smiles of them all that we walked out of the theater and out onto the fog-wreathed streets. My dear fellow, I said, whatever it was, not another word, said my friend. There are many ears in the city. And not another word was spoken until we had hailed a cab and clambered inside and were rattling up the Charing Cross Road. And even then, before he said anything, my friend took his pipe from his mouth and emptied the half-smoked contents of the bowl into a small tin. He pressed the lid onto the tin and placed it into his pocket. There, he said, that's the tall man found, or I'm a Dutchman. Now we just have to hope that the cupidity and the curiosity of the limping doctor proves enough to bring him to us tomorrow morning. The limping doctor? My friend snorted. That is what I have been calling him. It was obvious from footprints and much else besides when we saw the prince's body that two men had been in that room that night. A tall man who, unless I miss my guess, we have just encountered, and a smaller man with a limp, who eviscerated the prince with a professional skill that betrays the medical man. A doctor? Indeed. I hate to say this, but it is my experience that when a doctor goes to the bad, he is a fouler and darker creature than the worst cut throat. There was Huston, the acid bath man, at Campbell, who brought the Procrustean bed to Ealing and then he carried on in a similar vein for the rest of our journey. The cab pulled up beside the curb. That'll be one and ten pence, said the cabbie. My friend tossed him a florin, which he caught and tipped to his ragged tall hat. Much obliged to you both, he called out as the horse clopped out into the fog. We walked to our front door. As I unlocked the door, my friend said, Odd. Our cabbie just ignored that fellow on the corner. They do that at the end of a shift, I pointed out. Indeed they do, said my friend. I dreamed of shadows that night, vast shadows that blotted out the sun, and I called out to them in my desperation, but they did not listen.